Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, as Executive Director of the European Centre for Modern Languages of the Council of Europe, it is an honour and a pleasure for me to introduce our keynote speaker, Professor Henry Woodison. As I'm sure many of you here know, Professor Woodison is an internationally acclaimed authority in the field of applied linguistics and language teaching, specifically English language learning and teaching. He has a Master of Arts from Cambridge and a PhD from Edinburgh, where he began his academic career as a lecturer in applied linguistics. In 1977, he was appointed Professor of Education at the University of London, with particular responsibility for the teaching of English to speakers of other languages. For several years, he was concurrently Professor of Applied Linguistics at the University of Essex, and subsequently Professor of English Linguistics at the University of Vienna. He has been Chairman of the British Council's English Teaching Advisory Committee, a founding editor of the journal Applied Linguistics and Applied Linguistics Advisor to the Oxford University Press. He has written extensively on a range of topics relating to applied linguistics, including discourse analysis, the stylistics of literature and language teaching education. He now lives in relative retirement as Professor Emeritus University of London and Honorary Professor University of, Ed of Vienna. He was described in the Rutledge Encyclopedia of Language Teaching and Learning as being probably the most influential philosopher of the late 20th century for international ESOL, quite an accolade. We are delighted that he has agreed to come out of relative retirement and talk to us today. But before I give him the floor, I would like to share with you a few interesting discoveries I made about him when preparing for today's event. Certain key concepts which seem to underpin his approach and characterise his thinking. The first is about the relationship between research and practice. In an article entitled TESOL, Art and Craft, published in the Journal of the Imagination in Language Learning and Teaching, Professor Woodison states that researchers in second language ac acquisition can never reveal the truth about language learning and never tell teachers how to teach. But in an interview from the non-native English speakers in TESOL of the Month blog in January 2009, he talks about the importance of teachers as critical thinkers who need to theorise about their practice. So research and practice each need to feed into and mutually enrich the other. This in many ways chimes with the philosophy behind the language education projects of the European Centre for Modern Languages where we try to bridge the gap between theory and practice, producing research-informed tools tried and tested by practising teachers. I described Professor Woodison a few moments ago as a leading international authority, but this is probably a description he himself is not comfortable with, because in the same interview from January 2009, he states, the first thing perhaps is to encourage them, teachers, to be sceptical about the advice of any authority, especially if it is acclaimed. He goes on to describe education as essentially subversive. And in another interview, he states that amusement does not preclude serious thought and that you do not have to be solemn to be serious. So, critical thinking, scepticism towards acclaimed authorities and humour. If we take these notions together with the title of his keynote, Rethinking Language Education, a Challenge to Tradition, I think we can be assured, assured of a stimulating, entertaining, insightful and provocative keynote. Please join me in welcoming Professor Woodison. Thank you very much indeed for that very flattering introduction, which I am sure I cannot live up to, as you will soon discover. Um, I'd like to begin by expressing my thanks to the organizers of the conference. Um, I feel very honored to have been invited to give this, you will be glad to know, brief address um, 
as a preparation for the subsequent panel of experts. Um, this conference, I, it seems to me, is a testimony to the achievement of the Council of Europe, its work in language education over the many, very many years. The work particularly, of course, of this centre in Graz, which and I, I take this, this to be a, as I say, a, a celebration, a testimony to their achievement. My own, my own role, as I understand it, or as I have taken it to be, um, is to present my own take uh, on language education uh, as, as a prompt, really, uh, to uh, a future, uh, to further discussion during this conference. And uh, uh, as Sarah says, um, I would hope that, that you will be skeptical uh, and critical uh, in your listening. Uh, what I'm intending to do is to provoke thought, uh, not to promote a cause. Um, having said that, let me um, then talk to this title, a Rethinking Language Education, uh, Challenge to Tradition. Um, to begin with, uh, tradition. Let's see if I can work this. Now I know I can work it. I feel much more comfortable. Tradition. The objective of foreign language education has generally been understood to be the acquisition of competence in one or more L2s, languages other than one's own L1. Competence being defined by reference to native speaker norms of linguistic knowledge and behavior. The closer learners approximate to these norms, the more successful they are assessed to be. The challenge. This traditional uh, view of language education as uh, an accumulation of such competencies in different languages has not, of course, gone unchallenged. Uh, the Council of Europe has, for many years, recognized the need to rethink the objectives of language education and to bring them more realistically in line with current economic and socio-political realities and have accordingly proposed an alternative based on the concept of plurilingualism. Whereby, to quote from the CEFR manual, or publication of some 10 years ago now. Uh, the aim of language education, this is the, the, the revised aim of language education based on plurilingualism. <laughs> Profoundly modified. No longer seen as simply to achieve mastery of one or two or even three languages, each taken in isolation with the ideal native speaker as the ultimate model. Instead, the aim is to develop a linguistic repertory in which all linguistic abilities have a place. And here there's clearly a shift in principle away from the absolute notion of mastery to the relative notion of variability from what learners, the shift therefore from what learners ideally should do to what they actually can do. Now, how profound, however, I would like to ask, in practice, is this aim of language education actually modified? What kind of modification does it actually consist of? The CEFR grades, A1, A2, B1, B2, and so on, may be intended to give credit to different abilities in a language and to put a positive spin, if you like, on achievement that would traditionally be negatively assessed as failure. Learners who can do things with a language at different levels can, in principle, all be equally commended. 
what can be done is always well done. To quote from Alice in Wonderland, everybody has won and all shall have prizes. Except that the prizes vary considerably in the worth attached to them. Because there's no escaping the fact that these scales are also prescriptive grades of proficiency measured against a native speaker ideal. An ideal, of course, we know few learners ever actually achieve. And the more precise the descriptors of these grades are, the more prescriptive they are likely to be in practice. A particular level may be entirely satisfactory for what learners need to be able to do with a particular foreign language. But this level is still a point on a grading scale. And the likelihood is that achievement will still be assessed relative to the C2 end point, called the mastery, rather than relative to what learners need to use the language for. Although one may accept, as a matter of principle, that the lower levels of ability are also to be recognised as ends in themselves, so that all, quote, all linguistic abilities have a place, in reality, they're still defined as interim stages of learning. And the place that they are assigned is accordingly a lowly place. In this respect, I would suggest the traditional aim of mastery is still presupposed. Indeed, that is the name given to C2. So one traditional assumption that still seems to persist, and one I think we need to think about, is that ability in a language can only be measured against the benchmark of native speaker competence. Even if we accept that such measurement is necessary, we run up against the problem that this competence is actually never defined. The descriptors that are proposed for measuring the extent to which this competence is achieved, though having the appearance of objective assessment, are in effect impressionistic, ultimately arbitrary, because of the indeterminacy of the concept of competence. Now, proposals have been recently made as to how these descriptors can be specified in more precise linguistic terms, worked by the English profile, which you are familiar with, no doubt. Apart from the fact that this, in effect, equates what users can do with their linguistic competence and conflates accuracy and fluency, the precision is only apparent, since it depends on the indeterminacy of the concept of competence. A second traditional assumption, still in tradition, that still seems to persist, is that languages which learners are required to be competent in, in being foreign, are all alike, because they're foreign. But foreignness is always relative. It can only be identified in reference to the language of one's own community. There are different kinds of foreignness. Languages are foreign in very different ways, depending on how their role, status, socio-cultural proximity, and so on, are perceived. Within Europe, intra-community languages, like Basque, Finnish, and inter-community languages, French and German obviously, are very different, are foreign in very different ways. They differ radically in respect to what we might call their communicative capital. 
and that this is reflected, of course, in the status that they are assigned in the European Union. Again, the foreignness of a neighbor language is very different from the foreignness of a non-neighbor language. And this is not only a matter of geographical proximity, but of attitude, which is likely to be a function of all manner of socio-political and historical factors. To take a topical example already referred to, the way a Ukrainian speaker perceives Russian as foreign is likely to be very different from the way Russian is perceived as foreign by, for example, an Italian. So foreign languages are not all alike, nor are they all equal. Although official policy may assert that all languages are equal, language users themselves know perfectly well that to adapt the words of George Orwell, some languages are equal, but some are more equal than others. And this variability in foreignness is not only a matter of attitude, which will inevitably have an effect on learner, learner motivation, but it will also regulate what it is of a particular foreign language people feel it is worthwhile to learn, as opposed to what they're told they should learn. Local perceptions of how a particular language is foreign and how particular outsiders want or need to engage with it will, of course, determine what kind of ability, the quality of the ability, not how much you learn, but what kind of ability is appropriate. And this may not correspond with the descriptors at different levels on the CEFR scale. These local factors would suggest that appropriate abilities in different languages would and should vary very considerably in kind and cannot all be evaluated by applying the same set of criteria. Europe is linguistically diverse, not just because it has a lot of different languages, but more crucially because the languages themselves are so diverse in their very foreignness. I think it's how to cope with this diversity that's the main challenge in language education. And it can't be met if this diversity is denied by treating all foreign languages in the same way and imposing a common set of criteria for successful learning. So, although redefining the aim of language education as the development of a plurilinguistic repertoire of variable competencies is a departure from traditional ways of thinking, traces of tradition remain. This redefinition still implies that the objective is to acquire different levels of competence in the plurality of different languages. And the further problem with this is that the resulting linguistic repertoire is necessarily quite narrowly restricted. Although allowance is made for the acquisition of partial competence in several languages, the number of languages concerned can only obviously be relatively small. This, of course, means that the repertoire of abilities that a particular group of learners acquire may be irrelevant to their subsequent needs for communication with speakers of languages other than those represented in their repertoire. If, for example, German learners have acquired a repertoire of abilities at some level in, say, Croatian, Czech, Slovenian, Hungarian, Turkish, what do they do when confronted with the need to communicate in Italian or Greek or any of the other diverse languages that it's the policy of the European Union to protect and promote. It's hard to see, it seems to me, 
how the acquisition of a necessarily restricted range of partial competences can prepare learners to communicate beyond them. So what would prepare them? What would be an alternative way of thinking of language education? What learners need, it seems to me, whether we can provide for this is another matter, but what learners need is a more generalized strategic ability to cope with unpredictable communicative demands in the future. A more generalized strategic ability to cope with unpredictable communicative demands. This would suggest that language education should be primarily concerned not with teaching competencies in particular languages as such, but with developing a more general capability in language. Different languages in this perspective, including the learner's own L1, would necessarily be drawn upon in the process of developing this capability. The selection of these languages would vary in different educational contexts, of course. It would depend on local factors of feasibility, relevance, perceptions of foreignness. All that would matter is that the language sources should activate communicative capability. Their function would be to exemplify, to provide particular realizations of the communicative and cultural aspects of language in general. Explicit reference to the L1 would relate the other languages to the learner's own experience, established thereby some degree of continuity, which is very often lacking from the language people are learning, learners are learning, to their own experience of language. This continuity would be provided for and would thus make it easier to associate linguistic form, communicative function, and cultural significance in the other resource languages in reference to their own. The objective would be then not for learners to add to their linguistic repertoire quantitatively, but for them to be aware of the nature of linguistic resources, to learn how to put these to strategic use. In so doing, they would naturally, and in consequence, and as a kind of byproduct, extend their linguistic repertoire and learn something of other languages in the process as a consequence. The traditional aim of language education is to teach bi or multilingualism, an accumulation of monolingual competences as a kind of rehearsal for the learners' encounters with those native speakers whose competences they are being required to aspire to being rehearsed to meet natives. And this, of course, as I've argued, restricts the scope of their interlingual communication to this chosen few, the languages that they have actually been presented with, been required to learn. And this would also be the case even with the shift of emphasis to plurilingualism which is still concerned with abilities in different languages and the extension of a linguistic repertoire. It is still, in a sense, additive. The alternative, an alternative, a possible way of thinking, would be to focus attention on lingualism, a capability for languaging. This would serve, I would argue, as an investment in strategies for further use and further learning through using. 
Defining the objective of language education this way, in terms of lingual capability, would, in my view, provide for the subsequent acquisition of competence is in different languages, as and when the need arises. It would also, I would suggest, provide a more realistic and achievable basis for the kind of intercultural understanding that sometimes claimed is automatically promoted by the learning of particular foreign languages. Beg your pardon? The question, of course, arises as to how this alternative concept of language education can actually be put into practice. Obviously, a good deal of research would be needed to critically explore the implications of this view for language teaching and testing. But this, surely, colleagues, is not a reason for rejection. After all, we are told that it took the combined efforts of experts from 41 countries over 10 years to produce the CEFR. Traditions, challenges, visions. In reference to the title of this conference, this proposal, this alternative thought that I am uh, putting forward is a departure from tradition. It might be dismissed as simply a delusionary vision, but I hope it can also be taken as a challenge in that at least it raises issues that, if they're not burning issues, are worth critically thinking about. Thank you very much. <laughs>